a flash cell. So they maybe do only like 100,000 items, and then they flash cell on WeChat and some other platform, so I'm every ball to buy it. So different way to do it. If you look after the car industry, you also get people doing it different ways, right? Tesla, they're going more to a driverless car model. You look after Uber, they're also going to the driverless car model, right? Blabla car in, uh, in Europe, in France, there's already a billion dollar company, it's more about carpooling, so different thing because this is more like two to 400 kilometers thing, where Uber and Tesla, you're more looking for short distance. And this car is more like you run by hour, right? So everyone is doing it in a very different way. And why we see like more and more of this kind of thing, I think now, is because a lot of them are using big data. When you think about Uber, for example, in Boston, they were able, if you go to the blog, you can see they were able to tell you if you paid someone, based on where you left, where you have been, and when you come back to your place. So just based on data, they were able to get this kind of information about you. Um, and then, of course, they use a lot of analytics, and now you see like more and more like AI. So all this kind of thing involve like all this kind of new business model. But it's one of the first things we saw. Another thing is, some of the businesses just fail, even if they get the opportunity to be on the next trend. So borders, for example, they get the opportunity to do like some e-books with Amazon. But they believe this will don't work, right? So now what is happening is like Amazon is selling more e-books and books, and border doesn't exist anymore. When we look after Blockbuster, they get the opportunity to buy Netflix. They didn't. Now Netflix is doing pretty well, and Blockbuster doesn't exist. When you look after Kodak, Kodak invented the digital camera. They created it, but they believe that most of the revenue is coming from the, from the film, right? From the old business, and they don't want to kill their current business. So they didn't do the digital camera, and they made this move when it was already like too late. So this is like some of those guys may get the opportunity to do it, but they decided to don't do it. So what, what this is CV inside, right? You're going to see inside, you have like 40, 45 maps like that. And it's showing you that any industry, basically, is getting like attacked by a lot of different startups. So this is just the car industry, but you can also see this happening to banks. If you just look here, like for example, TransferWise is a London-based company, it's already a unicorn. So the thing is that the competition is not coming only from one company, but it's coming from like a thousand of companies coming and eating each of them a small piece of those large corporations. And why this is happening is also because company now may need less time to become a billion dollar company, but not in valuation like unicorns, but doing sales, right? So here what we can see is like Dell, it took them like nine years to do a billion dollar in sales. But a company like Priceline or Groupon, it took them almost two years to do a billion dollar in sales. So I mean like for a lot of large corporations where they're feeling in the past that it will take forever to really, for a startup to make a dent in their business, it's going like faster and faster for now. Another thing is, it's coming also cheaper and cheaper to build the startups. So basically everyone can launch a startup now, especially if you're like a developer, it will cost you like very low, 5K now, if you just use like AWS, Microsoft Azure, and all those kind of platforms to build your company. So, Meaning, it's like faster and faster to build a company, and cheaper and cheaper. So I make this like accessible to a lot of people now. So I just want, I just show like a lot of people like maybe not so good for corporates now, but I just want you to do like, guess a little bit about those companies that are still alive, but they started in a very different kind of business, right? So this company, they started in 100 years ago. So if you're a fan of the company, I think now based on these colors, you can guess which company it is. It's BMW, that's correct. But what is interesting about BMW is like they study to do engine for planes, right? And they get prohibited to do it. So they decide to do cars. But they survive, right? They get this massive challenge, but they survive. This company is like Asian company, very more complicated. Also like 90 years old company. It's like you do manufacturing for like elk and love, right? A long time ago. Then they mentioned the lean manufacturing. So I think at this stage you can guess which company it is. It's Toyota, right? But it started with like a very different business. But they managed to survive. And this one, this, I saw like some people who were 
wider room who are working in this company based on the sign up. I don't know if they're here tonight. But. So this company started by selling dry fish. This is not the official picture, just the old picture that I found about the corporation selling like dry fish, vegetable, and fruits. And some of you guys are using those products, right? But the company started by doing that. So now based on the currency, you can be guess the nationality of the company. This is Samsung, right? But it's like by doing dry fish, right? No, they're doing like some devices that you put in your, you can be taking a plane, right? But they started doing like very different thing, right? So the question is like, why those companies manage to survive doing a lot of different things? Some of them become more like a conglomerate, like what you can see maybe now with like company like Google, by doing a lot of different things. So we saw like a lot of those trends were like, okay, we want to understand more like what is really happening and, and how corporate are working with startup, how corporate are working to innovate. So we decided for that to partner with INSEAD. Uh, INSEAD is pretty well known for this report, the Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, and, and we decided to go with them about learning more about what is happening. So what we did, we took the 2,000 biggest public company worldwide. And we picked up the 500 biggest one. And for each of them, we checked like what they are doing with startups, one by one. And we found like some very interesting things. So I will just share with you like a few things that we found that those corporates are doing and that we're maybe not expecting this kind of thing. So for example, DocuSign, they raise a full round only with corporate VCs. Only corporate money, no VC. So this can be seen for VC as a trade, right? Maybe you get kicked out of a late stage round because corporate are putting all the money on it. You can't have access to this round maybe if you're if you a VC. We also check like those unicorns, right? So at this time it was around like 103 unicorns on the Wall Street Journal uh, ranking. And we check all of them one by one, and we found that the majority of them, like in fact 61.7% of them, have received at one point money from corporates. And here we have been very strict. We removed every bank, every financial institution on that. If you include bank, financial institution, and if you look also after all the VC who have received money from corporates, you'd be close to 100 anyway that at one point, in one way, those startups received money from, from corporates. And then we found some very interesting partnership like Spotify and Coca-Cola, like why a music streaming company will partner with a beverage company. So when you look after the Spotify angle, it's like, why should you partner with a company like Coke? They're just doing drinks, right? And you're doing music. They're not like very digital company, they are very old company. Why you will partner with those people? What Coke owns is like one of the best distribution system in the world. So when you look after how many trucks deliver Coke cans worldwide is more than UPS, DHL, and FedEx together. So it's kind of like if you spin off this system of Coke about delivering, it's like bigger than any of those companies. So the thing is for Spotify, if you manage to get your logo on those cans in a way that people, for example, with a QR code are able to download the music, you just get a massive reach. The second thing is Coke is delivered and you can buy a Coke in any country of the world except two. So North Korea for sure, and the second one, Cuba, right? And Cuba may change soon. So soon it will be only one country in the world that you can be distributed uh, by working with Coke. Then the question is like, why Coke may do stuff with Spotify? And one of the reasons is because Coke wants to also deliver a better experience to the consumer, not only about a drink, but it's about experience. So what they're looking for is also like, why not when you get a drink, you get the opportunity to listen to one of your best or favorite songs. So this is what, for example, Coke is looking for when they do this kind of thing. Another example is about um, Disney. So Disney, a um, few years ago, they bought like Lucasfilm for a few billions, and Lucasfilm owned Star Wars, right? And then um, Walt Disney decided to do an accelerator with Techstar, and during one of the mentoring sessions, one of the C-level person from um, Disney show to this company called Sphero that they are building, they will have like these small robots in the movie. So Sphero then built this one, right? And these have been like millions of units sold. So just because like Sphero get access through Techstars to the C-level people at Disney, because it was a Disney accelerator, they were able to put us this product. But when you think about, if you do a hardware product and it's kind of the way to advertise it, it's like Star Wars movie, it's like massive in terms of communication plan, like the reach you get. And then you have like some other company like Orange Telecom, who are also doing a lot of work with startups. Like in Israel, you get the fab from, from Orange, you get like 
Um, some people doing also investment here from Orange. So we don't talk so much about Deezer and Dailymotion, we are more like um, music streaming um, and um, video streaming. But when you look after the two other products, who are like hardware, the thing is like what a corporate can offer to hardware company like those two. And here what is interesting is like Orange was supporting those people by supplier access. Everyone think about a customer access when you want to work with corporates as a startup, but here you also get like a supplier access. The thing is when you do hardware, if you go to Chen Z and you ask a supplier like, can you do like 10K units of my product? This would be very difficult because the minimum order may be 50 or 100 Ks of the product. So the thing is having a, a partner like Orange already are ordering like millions of units of boxes for internet connection and etc. It's slightly easier to be able to do like your small batch of products. Then we also look after those R&D companies that are spending a lot of, like large corporations spending a lot of money in R&D. And at this time when we produced the report, it was like nine out of 10 are working with startups. And in fact, just after we released, it was like 10 out of 10. So you start starting to do like more work with startups too. You, we really found like any industry working with startups. So here we just showcase like an insurance company from China but you can find like oil and gas company, railway company, insurance, bank, cars, makers, everyone is really working with startups now. And when we look after countries, we were expecting to see like the US like being number one. But what was interesting is we found that France was number one. So in France we get like 23 out of 25 of the biggest corporations who are working with startups. So this was quite interesting. And in fact, like US is below the average. US is around like 45.5% of them working with startups. I will share with you then later like, what is the average. We also found like company like um, ProCBN who are doing like media for equity. So not only like cash for equity, but also media for equity. So different way to do it. In Singapore, for example, you get MediaCorp doing the same model of media for equity. So it's not only like in Europe, but also in Asia. And then as I mentioned, you really found like any kind of people working with startup. Tiageo are doing an accelerator in London. So if you want to, to build the next whiskey or the next alcoholic drink, you can go there. So there's definitely like no limit in terms of what you can do um, as a corporate. The government is also doing things like the CIA have their own venture arm, right? So it's not only corporates, also government are working with, with startups. And then what we also saw is a lot of collaboration between corporates. So for example, this fund, the Economy Ventures, is like five corporates who team up together to do investments. What is interesting here is more what we will call like a vertical integration because none of them would compete. You get a tire company, you get a telecom company, you get a railway company, you got also like an oil and gas company, right? So different industries, but same focus about eco-mobility, right? So all of them um, aggregate to do investment in this field. So what we found is like, 52.4% in fact of those corporations, of those 500 biggest public corporations, are already engaging with startups. And what also is interesting on this graph, you can see there's very strong correlation between the size of the company and how much they work with startups. So the top 100 is working two times more than the bottom 100. And here, when we talk about working with startups, in fact, we look after different things. So this is more like what we call the Swiss Army knife. It's like a lot of different ways than corporate and work with startups. In a report, we describe like each of them, you have a lot of different examples and subcategories. So this is like global one. But the thing on the report, we look after those sevens that you see here on the bottom. We look after thing that it means that corporate are really working with startups. It's not like sponsoring an event. So the number one choice that corporate are doing is a corporate venture arm. So out of those 260 plus company working with startup in our report, the majority of them working with startups are doing through a corporate venture arm. Then the second thing is about a startup competition, which is quite easy to organize, not too expensive, right? But still some skin on the game. And the number three is the accelerators, right? So these are the top three things that we that we saw, like those corporations when they're working with startup, this is what they're doing. Then we also saw a lot of difference between countries. So as I mentioned, France was number one, but what is also interesting is, out of the top five, you get like four in Europe. The only one outside of Europe is Japan. And when you look after Japan, here what we found is like most of the corporate working with startup in Japan are doing through corporate venture arm. When you go on the other side, you go in Japan and you ask people in Japan who invests in startup. A lot of money is coming for corporates, a lot. 
there's, there's a lot of deals where he's only cooperating in Japan. I'm, our colleague James wrote a blog post about that in TechCrunch. Then most of the money, I think it's like 70% is coming from, uh, from corporate in Japan. So different countries, different way to do it. But also by industry. So for example, if you go to the pharma industry, same, most of them are doing it through corporate VC. So that is maybe because it's, they don't want to take too much risk when it's too early, it's too much risk for the pharma industry. Maybe the Japanese don't want to take too much risk too. Uh, so it's like different way to, uh, to look after like how you want to engage with startups. Then you have like different tools available to do it. So what we found at the end is like these three different ways for corporate to work with startups, to innovate. It's like you partner, you buy, or you build yourself, right? So the, our report is mostly about partner, partner. But here it's about more buying. So this was in CB Insight, and I disagree on one way. It's like, I don't consider Facebook, Google, and Yahoo, and Rakuten as a tech companies. Um, Facebook for me is more a media, Google more advertising media, Yahoo, same. And Rakuten is like retail. But what we found, what they found is like, you get a lot of companies who have been acquiring companies for more than one million, who are like not in tech, like Walmart, Unilever, GM. So GM just acquired like uh, Cruise Automotion, for one million, we need a very bought like dollar shares club for one million, one million two, and Walmart they bought like Jet.com for three point three billion, right? So all those corporates, all their company are buying those startups, and one of the reasons, especially when you look after uh, Walmart and you need a very Walmart, they bought Jet.com, but they're buying an e-commerce company that already retail. We need a very, they bought dollar shares club, same, they're buying like more like e-commerce and they're already retail. So they're just finding a way to become like more digital. And GM is also about more like technology, about driverless cars. It's what they bought with cruise automation. But it's not only about partnering and buying. You can also build. There's some company doing pretty well at building things like 3M. They, they created the Post-it. And it's quite an interesting story, right? Because they find something that doesn't stick very well. So 3M is more about let's find something that will stick well forever. Not just like slightly. But then they spent a lot of time to think about that. And they found like this product. What is interesting is like 3M, if you look after the number of products that are selling two days, a lot of them doesn't exist like two or three years ago. So they really changed all the products that are selling over time. They don't wait that something doesn't work anymore. They're already like producing and launching new product all the time. They never stop. People know them for, for positive, but they're doing a lot of products for healthcare. They're doing a lot of products for, for your car, for the windows on your car, and etc. They're really doing uh, thousands of products, not only the positive that is quite visible. And then you get Google, like everyone knows Google, they're doing this kind of 20% project, etc. But this idea of the 20% project doesn't come from Google, it comes from 3M. 3M started with like this 15 to 20% of your time to build things. It's not coming from Google. Google makes this like very visible, but it's 3M having this kind of mindset initially. And here, I don't know if some of you have tried like Google Wave. Uh, this was a long time ago, I was fun at trying that, but it didn't really succeed, right? And then you get from the ball GM, Google News, who are product that are built, built internally and doing pretty well now. And then we think about Rakuten, say different story. So Rakuten, they bought like Vicky, who was one of the 500 portfolio company in, uh, in Singapore. The interesting fact is like a lot of corporations, when they bought a startup, they may have a retainer. They may keep the founder for like one, two, three years. And then most, I mean, often, the founder left. So this is what happened with like, when Amazon bought diapers, the founders, I think it's exactly after two years, he left and he created Jet.com. Right? Then he got acquired by Walmart. But Vicky, you get a, only a one year retainer. It's already like three years or four years ago. He's still working with Rakuten. But he's on the board of the company and now he's building like new product like Repo. So the question is also like under like building, here it's more like building, like acquiring and, and building. Like how can you acquire talent and find a way that those people are staying and building products internally. So this is a different way. And then you get some cooperation who are doing like partner and building at the same time. So Airbus, for example, they have launched an accelerator where they mix entrepreneur and entrepreneur. So you get 50% of the people coming through this program who are like employees. The other 50% are entrepreneurs. So they want to mix everyone. The good point for the Airbus when they do this kind of thing, there's also DBS trying to do this kind of thing in Singapore, is also more about they want to change the culture. But this is a good thing for the entrepreneur because they can also talk to like people from the company, giving you big, bigger and better insight about what is really happening and what could be a good match in terms of product that you could build. That I mentioned, like the DBS one, 
And the Cisco is an interesting model, right? Uh, I think it was not really like the plan, but they got those three guys who was working in the company, they go out, they build a product, they receive funding from Cisco, they got acquired, and they did that like a few times. They did that, I think it was two times. So it's an interesting way that, at one point maybe the corporation feel like we can't build that internally, but people know what the company need. Why not you go out, we give you funding, you build the company, if it works, we'll buy you, you come back. So they did that like two times. It's a bit what Google is doing now. When you look after Google Ventures, they also invested in a lot of former Google employees. And also I think they own building now in Google where they want to put like people who want to quit the company and build stuff. So it's also like how can you as a corporate build your own ecosystem of former employees and invest in them and, and be able that to keep them like close close to you. So what we did in the report, we did like three small case studies about those three companies like Microsoft, TBS, and Orange Telecom. We look after like three companies coming from three different countries, three different industries, and everyone is looking at solving like different challenge. So as I mentioned, DBS, one of the main things they try to change now is the culture in the company. So you are a bank, you are an old bank, how do you change the mindset of your employees? How do you change that? How do you manage that those people innovate? Orange is more like most of the telecom company about how can you increase the average of new producer? How do you reduce the churn like all quitting your your, your, your subscription system to join like all the company. And Microsoft, what is interesting is, they are like more of the platform, so it's like the adoption of the tools. And what was interesting on Microsoft is, a lot of people will say like, okay, um, I'm working for, let's say, a, a foreign company, everything happened in the HQ, right? If I'm a subsidiary, I don't create anything, I don't really work with startups. But the Bispark program, that is Microsoft program with startups, started in France, right? So, when I was doing my, in fact, I was doing my internship at Microsoft, my boss in, the, in this division called TP at this time called TX now, they started to do like this program called Bispark where they were offering like free software to start up for three years. But they started to do that in France at this time it was called like ID in French, it was like ID in English. They studied that and then they expand worldwide. So this kind of thing about engaging with startup, don't necessarily need to come in the street from the HQ. You get some company who create like small pilots locally that this works well. Then they send sometimes the guy to the HQ, they deploy worldwide. So this is what, what one of the examples of what Microsoft is, is doing. Another thing, interesting thing, we don't mention that on the report, but about Microsoft is a lot of things could think about very expensive. If you think about Google, right, they're doing a lot of things with entrepreneurs. They have a team of like 30 people that go for entrepreneurs. Those people are paid and don't generate any revenue, right? Uh, when I was at uh, this division in Microsoft, they get like few people who are selling like Visual Studio software. So you get like few people based on the sales, they manage to make like more or less a division break even. So the thing is, you can find a way to work with startups, and this was this division was not only with startups, it was with independent software vendors, uh, with schools, um, and, and with startups, for example. So you get engaging a like, different ecosystem, but they found also a way to make this like more or less break even, to don't be too much dependent on the HQ or on your subsidiary. So this also makes this like sustainable. So it's not only about having a lot of money, and sometimes it's possible to do that locally at, at the small scale and do have this work. Of course, if you want to expand this kind of thing, or for most of the thing happen here, when you look after TBS, they're doing a lot of things only in the last two, three years, but because the CEO really want this to happen, is pushing very, very hard to be sure all this kind of thing are happening now. So DBS in Southeast Asia, you go to almost any kind of startup events. I mean, the large conference, you may see someone from DBS around. If he's not speaking, you see them like really like everywhere. They're really pushing everywhere in the, in the region. So in the report, we just share a little bit more about all this kind of thing. We have a lot of examples. Uh, uh, we have like some recommendation uh, on it. Um, at the end of the today, after the panel, we have printed um, some reports, so you can get an art copy of the report. If you want to be a little bit more like eco-friendly, you can just send me an email. You just put like, can you please send me a copy of the report and I send you the link where you can download the report. But if you prefer hard copy, we also have made like some uh, some hard copy. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was awesome. Now stay with us because we're going to move on to the panel. Uh, so, uh, to the stage, I would like to invite, except for Arnold, who's already here, uh, Zach Weinsfeld from uh, Microsoft Silica. Ventures. He's Hi. heading the global... Thank you. 
thanks a lot. A global, um, uh, basically the whole, the whole global accelerator program of Microsoft. Also, the vice president of Siemens, uh, Dr. Owen Sven Schäuble. And finally, Barack Goldstein, who's going to be moderator for the panel. He's a VC investor, a serial entrepreneur, and also the chairman of Creators. Thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, Sven, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, I work for Siemens, and I'm responsible for the startup corporations um, worldwide. So uh, we have a team in uh, Berkeley, California, one in China, in Shanghai, since July 1st with Rene, um, permanent uh, presence here in Tel Aviv, and of course also in Munich. Um, I started with uh, Siemens more than 10 years ago. Um, had a sad experience with uh, Siemens, so to start with the first failure, I was part of the handset business. So I experienced how an established company can go from 5 billion revenue to zero in three years. Uh, since then, I have tried to work on the opposite way, from zero to 5 billion, and this is also what makes me very passionate to look into uh, innovations for Siemens. Hi, um, Zach Weisfeld, Zachi for the Israeli. Um, I'm from uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Accelerator Program, uh, which is an interesting uh, program um, that we started five years ago. We actually started out here in Israel, and then it became a global uh, program. We run eight programs, uh, Bangalore, Beijing, Berlin, London, Paris, Seattle, um, Tel Aviv. We actually haven't announced the eighth one yet, so we're going to announce it soon. Um, so seven programs, 520 startups graduated, $2 billion raised, 37 exits uh, per acquisition, three through IPOs. Average funding for startup is about um, about uh, 4.6 million, 80% of the startups are funded. So the program has been working pretty well. Um, and um, talking about failures, it's tough to do these things inside corporate. It's uh, almost not natural, right? And, and uh, when I meet with other executives from um, many CEOs or, or CXOs from Fortune 100, Fortune 500, it doesn't matter. 
You said I think part of the reason that we've been successful is we started outside of corporate, outside of headquarters, sorry, um, which most of the people internally thought it's not going to work. Uh, actually, most of the people in the industry thought it's not going to work, Microsoft Accelerator. So um, it was a rocky start, um, and uh, but it's been a startup. It's been an internal startup, getting funding uh, every year, you know, making the shifts, making the pivots constantly. Um, so there's a lot of things that didn't work, lots of things worked well, and we keep on changing. But doing these programs in the right way inside corporates, super hard. And lots of lots of examples of uh, the, when we partner with others, etc. It's, it's not an easy thing. So Zach, I have, I have two questions for you. Uh, by the way, I've been in Microsoft as one of the best. For sure, years, I don't know other part of the world. I, I, I didn't have the, you know, the experience to see, you know, uh, I was asked to work with other startups uh, as a user, but uh, and I invested in a few startups that came out from Microsoft Accelerator. Uh, so you know, my uh, objective eyes is, is very successful. Before. The question is, you know, you started in Israel, and as you said, as you mentioned now, you have a few other spots around the world. So how you compare now the Israel ecosystem to other parts of uh, like the new accelerator around the world? If you have to compare the differentiation, or let's see. So I run all these programs, so I love all of them, and they're all great. Um, so there are differences, um, and uh, the founders, I think the interpreters are different in different places around the world. You know, China is, is different in almost every aspect. Um, what we see still in Israel, Israel is still very deep tech. Uh, very deep tech um, founders are super strong in technology, challenged with the way they look at market. And the way they go to market um, that we you know we we try to help with uh, when you look at areas like uh, um, in China, those the interesting the challenges in China are different. I'll give you a couple examples. Um, in any given time, there are hundred startups doing the same thing. So marketing is super important to get above the noise, get the right relationship with CCTV and beyond TV. Is super important. Get them the be in the media is super important. The other thing is hiring is, is really hard. You hire 100 people in a year. So we had a startup, they started two people and then they were 100 people at the end of the year. So how do you help them hire? Again, these are things that are very, very unique to China, very different than, than the other places. Um, India is used, it, it tends to move a bit slower than in other places. I think the cycles are a bit longer. The tech adoption by local partners is a bit longer. Um, so it depends. Every place is a bit different, um, and they're all great. So I have another question, but uh, before I ask you, uh, uh, Sven, I saw and I read a bit about uh, uh, about uh, 47 Next 47. It seems like a very uh, innovative approach for innovation. Uh, it's a combination of external and internal innovation programs. And if you can elaborate a bit and you know share. What, what's going to be the program you have to take to for the next five years? So I'd love to hear Yeah, absolutely. So Next47, I'd say, is the next evolution of what we have done for the last more than 50 years, um, during which our strategy to work with uh, startups has been ac actually very simple. Um, we have always partnered with uh, startups, startups. We have invested into startups, and we have founded our own startups. So in the last... 15 years or so, we have already invested 800 million euro into almost 200 companies. Uh, every year, we contact more than a thousand startups and form partnerships in a size of maybe 30 to 50. We have uh, created our own companies, a dozen companies that have come out of this um, um, environment. And now we are scaling up this strategy with the next 47. The next 47 is a reference to the founding year of Siemens, which was founded 1847 in Berlin. And as Joe Kaiser always says, yeah. I'm sorry, a new company. Yeah. Um, and as Joe Kaiser always says, not in a garage because at that time garages didn't exist, um, but in a backyard. Um, and what he wants to express with Next 47 is that we want to go back to the entrepreneurial roots of Siemens, that also started out as a startup co company, has always had. A big dream has always 
um, thought globally and big and has turned in a, into a very successful company over more than 170 years. And this is what we now want to do. Um, and we do this with a very decisive move. Um, the board of Siemens has decided to invest 1 billion euro over the next five years into Next47. Um, and has also decided to focus the activities of Next47 of, on five fields that we believe are related to the core of Siemens, but are kind of the disruptive forces that are changing significantly the markets we are in. So this is artificial intelligence, it's blockchain technologies, it's connected e-mobility, it's uh, autonomous machines, and it's the decentralized electrification. And um, in those fields, we apply the complete tool set. So we can invite external startup companies to work with us to, to find applications in the markets we are in. If the startup is interested, and we are interested, we can put money into the company. Um, but I think what is even more important is we can put smart assets into the company. I think you made some very uh, nice examples from other companies like Proceed providing advertising uh, space. We can provide access to markets, we can provide access to customers, we can provide access to, um, to our global reach, um, to technology expertise, and all that is of um, high relevance and value to the startups and we can bring this in. And last but not least, um, we, we are leveraging our own workforce um, to pick the best ideas and then bring those employees into an environment that is a little bit different from the typical Siemens organization to give them the entrepreneurial freedom and allow them to innovate um, and create new business opportunities for us. You know that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think it's inside the, the TTP, like tech to uh, business unit. So you have a problem already the, the employees from, uh, from the company, if you have a good idea, can establish a company and then the venture will invest to know the, the sum and will get 51% of the startup, something like that. You have, you have, you have a problem inside Siemens. Yes, yeah, I said before, we are, we are not reinventing the wheel, we are building and scaling up what we already have. Um, and we have a program to partner with the startups, we have the Siemens Venture Capital Group, uh, with different funds to put money into companies. Then we have uh, some fund to provide um, money and resources to employees. Um, and we have a vehicle that allows us to have startup companies fully financed by Siemens, but still not being consolidated and with that not being part of the standard processes of Siemens. And now we are scaling this up in number of times. So how, so how do you uh, solve the IP issue? Because you know, it's, it's a big issue usually if you take like, uh, uh, internal innovation and you know, the spirit of, uh, spirit of uh, establishing a new startup, usually, usually most of the corporation, corporates have, have, have a problem with the IP or to share the IP or so what's, what's the solution in Siemens? Yeah, we have, we have contractual relationships um, with the startups we invest in or we create. And if Siemens puts IP into a startup, then this is part of the asset and we, are, uh, we have um, a part of the equity so, um, and we own it indirectly. If we work with a, with a startup, then we make a contract um, that clearly defines on who is doing what for what. And if IP is brought in by the startup, then we clearly um, um, say to what extent are we allowed to use this IP? Do we pay for this IP? If new IP is being generated through the partnership, we already clarify in the beginning who owns what, or for what markets, or for what time. So this is a contractual um, thing. Uh, Zach, I know that uh, Microsoft had uh, a program named uh, Microsoft Garage that is for, for employees, and I know that from 2014, you know, everybody can, you know, can see the program, or the ideas in, in the website, you know, I wanted to uh, hear your take about you know, the key success, uh, success factor of the program, and how, uh, what's, what's the result in that? So, Microsoft, and again, Microsoft today is a very different company than I think many people know or still think of. Um, Satya came with a very new spirit of growth hacking, um, so things have changed since the time that you've been with Microsoft. Uh, and um, 
one of the most exciting things we're running are these company-wide hackathons, for example. Uh, we just finished one with some super, super interesting new ideas that will become products and will become some ground, groundbreaking products in different areas, um, some in health, some in, in consumers, some in enterprise uh, world. Um, the garage plays a big play in that. Uh, the garage, we've just opened a garage in, in Herzliya, which is, um, you can think of a lab, it, it's a candy store for any geek. Uh, it's, you have the 3D scanner, the 3D printers, and cutters, and um, machines that can embroider um, uh, fiber into clothing, all kind of cool stuff that um, you can have people that work inside the company go and do things on their uh, free time or through hackathons, or you can have people in the community that we work with to do these. Uh, we see uh, amazing projects coming out of that, uh, and we, what's also interesting is uh, the way our employees now are thinking on uh, doing new things and innovating and um, taking the freedom to do things very, very differently. Um, we have leveraged the accelerators for that as well, so we have multiple internal teams, uh, what we call intrapreneurship programs, where we have multiple internal teams coming and doing, uh, either joining a cohort or doing their own sessions together with our managing director. So the garage is part of that phenomenon. Um, and uh, it's super exciting to see uh, the way that um, innovation and growth hacking and thinking in a new way out of the box has really got into the new DNA of Microsoft. And, and you know, got into result are any like uh, do you guys implement you know any any idea or new product that came out from the program? Yeah, so absolutely, there are, um, there are specific things that came out came out of the hackathons or work in the garage that have been. Uh, have been put into play in our large uh, products and are being shipped as part of our products, yes. Uh, and then, first of all, it was very interesting uh, presentation. And let's put those two guys aside because they are very innovative. But let's speak about, you know, about the market because you know, uh, usually in Israel, you know, it's very similar to Silicon Valley, but in other like, mature markets, you see, you know, uh, most of the corporates now uh, are, are, uh, are you know, deciding to do something. You know, you see it in the last few years, they want to, to innovate, to be at the of their innovation. Uh, the first thing that usually they will do, they will do hackathons, and then probably the, it started as hackathons, and now everybody wants their own corporate accelerator. And usually after the first two, three years, uh, you can see a, a few examples in Israel, they, they will close the accelerator, and, for other so you know, what do you think you know, is, is the right model for uh, for corporate uh, in a saturated market like Israel, Silicon Valley, so because the competition is so big, uh, the value proposition is very difficult. It's a blur in the market for the entrepreneurs. So when you look after corporate, for example, the accelerator side, we're all doing pretty well. I think Orange is doing pretty well, Telefonica is doing pretty well, Microsoft is doing pretty well. But we look after those companies that are running um, several accelerators, different locations, and they're creating more like close to maybe 100 companies per year, not like 10 or 8 per year, right? Uh, in Singapore, we got one corporate accelerator by SPH, a major company. They have done two batch of eight companies, and they're considering maybe shutting down. So what you need also, if you want this to succeed, you need to have enough skin in the game. It's like you play poker and you just do check at each turn. You will never win. So the thing is, when you look after corporate doing well in terms of accelerators, most of them are doing a very large batch. But even at the same time, you look after top accelerators worldwide. If you think about Techstar, YC, Founder, who is doing like 10 batch, 10 companies per year? Everyone is doing close to 200 per year, right? You can still find some exception like Angel Pad, where just having 10 companies per batch, but it's very niche. Thomas is a former uh, product manager at Google, he's doing only SaaS, B2B, he's very niche, he's very handsome with all those companies. So the thing is like some cases like Axios, you need to most of the time to really like really at scale. Like if you do too small, it will don't work. And if you look after the corporate perspective, right? If you are the CEO of the company and you ask, okay, you run that for three years. If for three years you did every year ten companies per batch. So meaning now you were like, what is the return of those thirty companies? The last ten, you can retalk. They just graduated, so you can just talk about how much they fundraise, but not so much. 
the previous batch just have one year, so you maybe don't have a massive exit or massive fundraising. So you're just still talking up to two years only after the first 10. So it's very difficult to show a lot of results only about 10 companies. It's like very small portfolio. So this is one of the challenges for like a lot of corporates because they want to do it, but they are maybe more looking about changing the culture, about the brand, about the visibility on Accelerator. Of course, right, if you want to innovate with startups and what you do is become an LP and a found, nobody saw it. Some large corporation will disclose on their annual report, but nobody will know like if Microsoft or Siemens are maybe LP in all the fund. Like for example, Nokia, the LP in several funds, is mentioned on the annual report, but who knows that, right? You don't look like a cool, innovative company by doing that. If you launch an accelerator, it looks like cool, innovative, you can attract millennials, it looks like you're doing stuff, right? But the long term is more difficult. So then the question is, it's not really like an accelerator is the right thing or the wrong thing. It's really part about why you're doing it. So we saw that more like as a tool. So then the question is about who is the company, what is the culture in the company, and what they want to change. What are the challenges they're facing on now, next five or ten years? But also who they are in terms of are they willing to take risk? So accelerators, you take a lot of risk compared to doing series B or series D investment. Are you willing to get short-term results or long-term results? If you go to accelerators, it may take time to get results because you go to early stage companies. If you go to later stage, it may be faster, but may cost more per company. So then it's like, are you willing to put a lot of money or not on that? So for sure, if you want like short-term results, um, don't take risk and cheap, it doesn't exist. So then you need to decide like which kind of profile you are and which kind of thing you want to solve. First of all, accelerators are a lousy business model. It's a horrible business model. If someone thinks they're going to make money by starting an accelerator, you're not going to make any money. It's, the, the math is really easy. I mean, you, you grow 10 companies, let's say 10 companies a quart, you invest heavily in you know, talent, space, all that, you get diluted. Um, so at the end of the day, one of that cohort will, will, will be an exit five, seven years from now, and you're going to have a tiny one, two percent, whatever, uh, out of that. And you need to pay seven years back for all your spend. N not a great business model. So um, the, there are two reasons to go into accelerators. One is strategic. The second is if you have a good follow-on uh, vehicle that you can, the, the ones that seem to be successful, you can go uh, after and invest more into. The challenge of corporate is a bit different. If you look at the data, there's a lot of data out there. Most of corporate accelerators have failed. And what's failing, you know, depends on how you, how you measure. Um, we measure the same way that I think most people in this industry measure is follow-on fundings. And you know, eventually, we want to see business traction. But, but on short term, we measure follow-on funding. Um, part of the reason that corporate accelerators fail many times, vertical is really tough. If you go vertically, then in order to have a good batch of about 10 companies, you need a good 200, 250 companies to apply in order to pick the 10 good ones. So first of all, you need a vertical that's wide enough in an ecosystem that has enough startups that, that can allow for that, that kind of scale. The second thing, the problem that the corporates has is culture. Right? So first of all, you need to be able to invest in this. So your managing director can't be a super smart MBA graduate. It has to be a serial entrepreneur that's done that before, can be a virtual founder for each one of the startups. Um, and the other thing is your expectations should be clear. Um, so we have a part, you know, we partnered with many companies around the world. One of them wanted exclusive deals with startups. Get what? Exclusive deals with startups do not exist in 2016. Or, you know, they were really dealing with why should we do a proof of concept to one of these startups if the valuation for the rest of getting some of these things are still a way of the past that some of these corporates from a culture perspective have to and then and there are other reasons, but 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 really to do that properly you need a, a large enough vertical and a proper program staffed properly. I think the most important piece of a successful accelerator is who's your managing director. It's gonna make the whole difference. Maybe, maybe one word about this uh, from the Siemens perspective. Uh, we don't own or operate any accelerator on our own, and we don't plan to do so, because we strongly believe in partnerships for some of the reasons you mentioned, but also because um, we want to focus on what we are really good at. And I think what an accelerator, an external ex accelerator from our perspective, can do much better is this whole training, coaching, mentoring, 
uh, connecting of the startups to the external ecosystem. What we are really good at is to make the internal connections, to make build the bridge into the Siemens businesses, to make these smart assets available to the startups. And this is what we strongly focus on. We love accelerators to partner with. Um, and in all locations we are active, we have strong partners, um, but we have no aspiration to do it on our own. I think just what Zach mentioned is when you look after the time frame on accelerators, it may take five to seven years to have this to start to pay off. And in the same time, if you look at the Fortune 100 in the US, the average time that a CEO will stay on top of the company will be five to seven years. It's not like Microsoft where they just got like three CEOs in like 35 years. So the thing is, if you are one of the guys managing those companies, you will start to pay off when you will left the company, right? So why do you do this kind of strategy? And when you look at so a lot of independent actors, a lot of them are doing like additional services and etc. to be able to get money. And the sum of them were working well is more because they also manage more as a fund. So they raise as a fund for 10 years, they have like management fees to run it, and then they invest this money out of the company. So it's, it's a different way to do it. Yeah, do you see any involvement? So, so you, we understand that the accelerator model is you know, it's not working for most of the corporate. Uh, is there any, any like evolving new model? Because if you look at the accelerator model, by the way, 10 years ago when they started, for example, uh, even in Israel, when the uh, ecosystem itself was very young, you know, the accelerator really gave back to the ecosystem and it, it supported the brand of the corporate. Uh, today, you know, most of the entrepreneurs are retail entrepreneurs, and even the first time entrepreneurs, usually in Israel, it's a small ecosystem, they can reach whatever they want and, and, and ask for guidance and mentorship and so on. So the, you know, the role of the accelerator is in Israel, for example, but also in Silicon Valley, it's, it's, it's very low. They really cannot a lot of value. Do you see any, any like, new program that is coming out? Uh, I think for the accelerators, it's really fun also why you're doing it. If you look after, for example, Google, uh, when you look just about Google Ventures, they have like a budget of 400 million per year to spend, right? So like if you add on that and Accelerate doesn't cost them so much money based on how much they're already spending, right? And then it's about the global strategy of the company. When you look after Google and Microsoft, they're among the top two companies where we build a full ecosystem. What I mean by building a full ecosystem? If you look at Microsoft, they start very early with like Imagine Cut. So you start with like students who are building products for competition, right? Then you get this part, then you support also a list startup machine. But it's like more like very early stage and this part is slightly after. Then you get the accelerators, then you get the venture arm, then you get the M&A team and etc. Google is doing the same thing, they're building a full ecosystem. So then, then depending on each piece also makes sense because you're building a full ecosystem. So it really depends on the strategy. But in terms of new models, um, I, will, I will mention two things. There is, um, there is a lot of partnership too. So for example, not on the accelerators, but more, I mean, with the accelerators, but like, Orange, Dutch Telecom, Singtel, and I think one or two other telco, they partner. Why it also makes sense? Because when you are like Dutch Telecom, your biggest market is Germany. When you're Orange, your biggest market is France and some other. But the thing is, as a telco company, most of the time your market is a country slash a region, not worldwide. So then if you partner with Singtel, you have no overlap. As Orange or Dutch Telecom, you have absolutely zero overlap with a company like Singtel. So this makes a lot of sense for them. Some industry, bigger network. An interesting model is what um, um, uh, Telstra is doing. So Telstra is a telecom company from Australia. So they already have one program in Sydney, they just studied one in Singapore. What they're doing and how they do it is first, they're absolutely agnostic. They just pick up the top 10 companies, doesn't matter if it makes sense or not on their core business. This is a slightly different way to do it because a lot of corporate are looking about what makes sense for our business. So that's a slightly different way. And also they always hire two people. They hire one guy who's already like from the company, so for example in Singapore, Again, Jamie is also, he was a former strategic partnership guy for Telstra. So he knows very well the company, he knows how to navigate, and because he's doing strategic partnership, he knows what people need. But this guy is really not the most, um, he's not really the best person to engage with an entrepreneur because he's not an entrepreneur, he never built a business, he's a corporate guy. So what they do, they always have a second guy who's more like an entrepreneur, a former entrepreneur. So this guy is more like facing the entrepreneur, helping them and supporting them on a day-to-day -day basis. But what they need to face, to have someone facing the corporation, they talk to the third person. So they're like two people to run it. So the thing is like, you try to get the best of both worlds, then you need to have a good collaboration between those two people. But if you try to get one guy who's like an entrepreneur and know how to navigate the large corporation, could be difficult. But if you get also to get the other guy who's a corporate guy and could be credible with like entrepreneur, it could be also challenging. So they decided to do it in a slightly different way, having two people to run like each program.
Well, you were asking about the trends in the accelerator um, world. I'm actually seeing three trends. Um, one is an increasing specialization on verticals. Um, secondly, I'm seeing that more and more accelerators start to form collaborations between industry partners and startups. And thirdly, probably related to that, I'm seeing a trend towards hardware and product development. So, then, yeah. so this, this combination, and of course, this is uh, very relevant to us and a trend that we try to capture for our activity. Just last uh, one question. I know that uh, when you started the Microsoft Accelerator, usually you, you, you guys uh, would pick uh, very early stage startups, and now we changed the model and tweaked it a bit. Uh, you know, what's, what, what was the reason? Yeah, so uh, for, for lack of a better name, we call it Scalerator, which takes the um, scale stage. Uh, what, what we figured out, first of all, we start seeing, started seeing many later stage companies applying to our program. Uh, we get about 10,000 applications a year to the program. We only accept about 2% of those across the world. So we started seeing a lot of companies that are later stage wanting to join. Um, and then we, we just did our own customer development. We talked to the, our entrepreneurs, to, our, to the VCs we work with, to others. And we figured out there are lots of great schools out there now called accelerators that would teach you lead startup and, and would do the canvas and all these great things. Some are better, some are, are not as good, but there, there are plenty of those. And yes, we can keep on doing that, but, but we wanted to find actually a place where we can actually bring more value. And what we figure out is that there's something we're really good at. Uh, Microsoft is probably the enterprise that mostly connect with other enterprises in the world. Um, and we figure out you know, funding is almost not a problem for startups these days, if, if they're good. So if, if you look at, at, at these, the curve, the S-curve, you know, there are many, many more startups now than ever. Right? It's the easiest time in history to start a startup. It's the hardest time in history to be successful. And the reason is um, that it's harder to get customers on. And uh, what we figure out is if we take companies that are a bit later stage, or so they're around their Series A, or we call market ready startups, we can fairly quickly engage our enterprise sellers and our uh, sales organization to help them actually get business. Um, and we make Microsoft happier, we make our customers and partners happier, and definitely the startups happier. You know, we have a tiny startup coming out of Seattle Accelerator um, uh, called OneBridge that sells into the oil and gas industry. It's a, it's a space we have a hard time selling into. Our sellers couldn't be happier, the startup couldn't be happier. They had millions of dollars of sales now through that, through that channel. So we are at Series A now. Uh, our cohort that started in the U.S. Uh, four weeks ago is average funding pre-accelerated is about $5 million. Uh, the cohort that started last week in Israel, average pre-funding is about $2.2 million, and some are selling at $2 $3 million already. So uh, we can work with them and go to market on specific customer engagements. And the other thing we do with them is we work with the CEOs. Most of them are first time or second time CEOs and still have, you know, it's still a challenge, you're the loneliest person in the company and you need to manage your board, you need to manage your investors, you need to hire your key people. It's no longer hiring your friends and family. It's really hiring the key people to drive the growth of the company. You know, how do you structure your incentive plans? How do you hire your key salespeople? These are the things we, we focus on these days. It seems to be paying off nicely. And, and we did this across the world. So now across the world with all our programs, we're moving to that stage. So uh, before we take a question from the audience, uh, I'd like to thank you guys uh, for sharing your experience and knowledge about the industry. And hopefully, Zach is here uh, on a regular basis. But, uh, you two, uh, hopefully, you will enjoy your best of the in the so guys, uh, uh, any questions from the crowd? Hi, uh, my name is Vivek and uh, we have a question. Uh, the general trend when you're trying to raise money, I'm a uh, first time entrepreneur. Uh, if, you, if you go and tell a VC that, you know, give me a million dollars and here's an honest business plan which will give you 10 million dollars back. No one seems to be interested because they think it's too small. Right? 
So why is it that you know everything is going to be like this world changing thing and can't we do small things and make small differences? Like why aren't we seen in the industry? The general approach. Yeah, I, I, I want to start. So uh, 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 the question. Uh, usually, we say are looking for a uh, big market because they are looking for big returns. So, uh, if you take one million dollars, you know, then you reach, uh, you, you show that your potential is ten million dollars in sales. It means that probably your exit strategy or the value of exit will be quite low for them. So, and then also, we see have their own investor; they have to return the money uh, to their LPs. So, uh, usually, you need, you, need, you, need, you need to sell them a dream. But a real dream that you can uh, uh, have your company backed by, by numbers. Uh, usually, ten million dollars is a potential for uh, for size is I can only add to that that maybe not all the companies in the world have to be backed by VCs, and that's also okay. okay. So it's, it depends on the model. If you have, if you have an option to have an organic growth and mm -hmm. not raise money from VC, that's the better option. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, saw that the scene has, uh, you know, identified some uh, areas for uh, focus and investment, but I didn't really hear anything about the medical equipment and that's where it's even just pretty big. So I just wanted to know, is there any specific reason for not investing into the medical equipment space? Yeah, I didn't mention it because it's indeed not a um, core focus of Next 47, but uh, the healthcare business of Siemens, that now is called Health in Years, um, is uh, doing their own investments and their own partnerships. Uh, but as you might know, we have uh, spun off or separated the healthcare activities a little bit from the um, order of Siemens. And that's why we also operate these startup activities a little bit independently from each other. But they are also looking for the same type of um, engagement models that we are applying. Thank you. Um, I'm from SAP. My name is Ev. I'm going to be here in Israel. Participated in entrepreneurship. I do UX. I mentor in several uh, startup accelerators. My question to you is, having participated in big corporate entrepreneurship program at SAP Europe and Israel, um, the challenge that we have is, is the judges and the referees. So what are your insights about selecting the judges and the referees to let the good stuff proceed? as opposed to the other stuff. Look, it's, it's, again, it goes back to culture. Right? You need to have the growth hackers, right? The people that are trying to challenge um, the common thinking of the organization. Not easy to find those. Um, the other thing I think that needs to be set ahead of time is what's the right mix. So you should always try and find the spots for um, to push the team to have some ideas that seems to be completely out there, right? That it's, there's no clear return anytime soon. It's it's something that might not be core business today, but might be um, close enough. There's no one today that owns that business. So I think if you agree that on you know, ten ideas that are being brought in, two should be like this, and let them be and and think through that um, on future, what we call Horizon 3 maybe, you know, things that may come later on. Uh, but it's it's hard to find those uh, individuals, especially that's been around long enough in corporates that think this way. And this is why a lot of, uh, and a few people here in the audience, that come from these innovation hubs inside these, uh, these uh, um, corporates, there was a mention on acquisitions and at the end of the second year the guys go off. Sometimes you can actually keep them on by going and doing some kind of an internal lab. Um, so get these guys to be judges. Uh, they'll think like an entrepreneur. In, uh, for example, in Singapore you get a very large company called MedLife. So they set up the innovation labs in Singapore. Why? Because they don't have any business in Singapore and in Southeast Asia. So this is exactly what Zach mentioned. If you go in a different country or different business where you don't need to challenge any existing business, means it's, you don't become the enemy of any VP of the company, you're more like, I'm coming to add some additional business. 
And if you can build that on top of what is already existing, it's perfect. But if you come and you're willing to kill one part of the business, it's people who maybe don't like what you're building. If you do on top or something like different, it's slightly easier to get like some support for this kind of idea. And for Siemens, I would say, this is still work in progress. Um, we don't have yet found the right combination of judges. Um, what I think is important that you have a mix of internal and external judges. And I think what is extremely important is that you have people who don't only look at why things won't work, but how they could work. And in particular in a large company, you have many, many people who will find a hundred reasons why this is a stupid idea, and you have to make sure that you have a balanced view in the judges. Hi, my name is Tarun. Uh, so my question has two parts. Uh, um, I repeatedly heard that uh, from, a, from a large corporation's point of view, you would want to have a large pipeline and a large vertical so that you can maximize the outcomes and success ratios. Uh, so what are some of the strategies that you look uh, for or do you deploy uh, to sort of uh, identify the startups for that particular vertical? Uh, that would be helpful to know as an entrepreneur. And number two, Second part of the question is that as an entrepreneur, when we are approaching a corporate, uh, what are some of the things that we need to be cautious about so that we don't get uh, sort of early on killed by similar kind of startups because you're sort of uh, supporting uh, sort of competitors, direct competitors, so to speak? Yeah, this is indeed a, a challenge to um, to manage. Um, we, we, we have a, like always in this business, we have a funnel, so we look at a great deal flow and out of a hundred contacts maybe one project is um, started that does not need to be an investment case but a corporation case. That means 99 case in 99 cases um, the answer is no. So my promise to the startup world is that this no comes quickly and substantially. So I promise I, I give a feedback, a qualified feedback why we would say no and I don't waste your time if I don't see a way to engage. And I think this is a challenge you will face with many corporates when you try to interact with them, that you are invited to meetings, to uh, share presentations, and provide additional backups, and do further analysis, and um, well, come to another meeting, and, and so on. And then after three months, you figure out you have invested lots of time and, and resources without any outcome. And therefore, I would recommend Always look for some bridge builders, um, the, the, the um, specialists who can build the bridge and who can make sure that you're not wasting your time when trying to interact with us. On the first question on selecting, it doesn't matter if we, we did a few vertical programs as well internally. It's the same way we select. We look for a great idea, a big idea. We look for a great team, a balanced team. So first the team. And a good balanced team, so if you come as a single founder and usually harder than if you have a good balanced team with you. You know, big idea. Um, coachable, so we want to see a CEO in the room, someone that, that acts as a CEO. We want to see a team that can actually survive for the next five, seven years uh, with disagreements. And um, and then the last thing we're trying, uh, um, and, and we'll, we'll spend time on behavioral stuff to figure out they can actually survive. And then the last thing is funding. And we use external, so all of our uh, selection committees We'll have more external investors for that stage inside their selection committees than our own internal people. So that's on, on selecting. On the question how to interact with, with uh, corporates, it's a tough one. And we're really bad at interacting. We, the big we, corporates are really uh, bad at interacting with startups. And if you don't get the right signals, if you don't get the no early, you can spend so many cycles, you, actually, you can actually kill your startup by getting the wrong signal. So find the bridges, not the ones that are asking for your equity to make a connection. These, I wouldn't spend too much time with them. But try to find, the, sorry if, if I offend anyone, but, but try, try to find the ones that this is their responsibility in the corporate to make these connections and listen. Listen to what they say. You may know what you're talking about, but listen how to approach. What would be the things that would make the person in that corporate tick, right? So you need to find the silver bullet that uh, hits that uh, uh, person needs. Uh, the other thing is you need to really listen and understand what you've been told. Many times, again, you've been told some one thing, you think you've been told something else, 
to make sure that, that you capture very well uh, what you've been told. If they tell you that it's a great idea for someone else in the work, they just told you no. Walk away. And, and you know, there are a lot of things you need to think through and get a good coach. There are lots of great mentors that would love to help startups in their ecosystems. Get someone that have done that before. It, it will be super valuable to, to break through these. I would like, you can also do your own due diligence, right? Before talk to a corporate, you can ask someone to really talk to them, point works, why the right person to talk to. And I will use also this image, right? When you're looking to get hired in a company, you can go to the HR department or you can go to the hiring manager, right? So if you go to the hiring manager, it will understand like what are your skills, what is transferable skills, and etc. right? So sometimes you just also by finding people that you already know in the company, who already work for them, like to who you should talk to, this will help you to save a lot of time because when you go to a company like Microsoft, it's like 100,000 people now. I don't know about Siemens, but the mall is the same size, no? So just to find who is the right person to talk to, not too junior, not too senior. Like, this is really strategic because you can already waste so much time just trying to talk to 10, 15 people who you may feel are the right person, but maybe they have no decision power. They have maybe not, they don't necessarily understand exactly what you're doing and how you can plug your thing in the company. So I will say, like, spend a lot of time on due diligence and ask. As, we, as you mentioned, it's also important that those companies have way more money and way more time than you, that be very clear about if it works or not and who are the next step and how to do it. Okay, thank you very much for the panelists. Thank you very much for everyone who was here with us. We actually recorded the whole thing, so if you want to uh, get back to uh, what the panelists have said before, you can go into Creators Ideation Lab Facebook page and just uh, record it again. Thank you very much for amazing partners, 500 Startups with Adam and Amir, and with Amazing Rise Tel Aviv team with Shirley and Omer and Milana. Thank you very much, and now the network is